First off, uh, thanks for being interested and, and, and thank you for providing a venue in which we can tell our story. It's, it's, it's important and I deeply appreciate it. Um, Fred Whitaker, um, I teach science, religion, and Holocaust studies in Louisville, Kentucky at St. Francis of Assisi School. The journey began in my classroom. I had been teaching Holocaust education for about three years or four years at the time. Uh, at, at the beginning, rather poorly, but I learned what, what good Holocaust and effective Holocaust education is. And at that time, because of the things I had learned, we weren't just crafting historians in my classroom. We were making students who were really deeply connected to their Jewish brothers and sisters you know, who are alive today. They had created some really wonderful personal relationships with our local cantors and rabbis and with the congregation of a synagogue that, that's here. And um, it was at the in 2004, that I had a student um, who had just finished her Holocaust class, and we had come back from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and we were just having a class, just dialogue, discussion. It really wasn't anything official, filling time, but it was brought up that no one else really had to study the Holocaust in Kentucky, and there was a, a student who was just, her name was Christine, who was unfathomably shocked that that was the case. She couldn't believe that students weren't mandated to do this. She said that it, to her, what she learned both about the history, about the obligations she had to you know, creating um, positive change in the world and the, the beauty that existed in the relationships that she was creating with people from other faiths, she said that those were probably more important than any of the math or even the science that I taught her. And she just was aghast. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry that there's no mandate in Kentucky. Well, she, I'll never forget, she paused, she looked from it, and then she, with a grin on her face, said, there ought to be a law. And that just really sparked something in me and in all of us. And um, she passed along that energy to next year's class. And she passed along the idea to next year's class that there should be a law. And so we called up uh, Mary Lou Marzian, who was our state representative at the time, and said, we have an idea. Um, it seems crazy. We didn't have any context for it. I hadn't done much research on it. Um, but she said, this is a wonderful idea. And so we began in 2005 to initiate the writing of the, of the legislation. We assisted with the wording. We began to call uh, other states where Holocaust education was mandated at the time to understand their journeys, to look at the wording of their mandates, and we submitted our first legislation. We ran into some phenomenal anti-Semitism at the time. Uh, in fact, the very first year, it was a very powerful senator who purposely uh, steered the legislation into the wrong committees for discussion. And as a matter of fact, this education legislation was uh, steered at first to the Agriculture Committee, where it obviously died that year. Um, so we were really stunned that that could happen. It was our first taste uh, of, of politics. It was the, you know, the, the washing away of the innocence that we had, that I had in terms of um, how bills are created and passed. And uh, we suddenly understood the, the need that we would have to actually be more powerful, more informed advocates um, and, 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 and shepherds of the bill. So, you know, that was 2005, 2006 and 2007. Um, what we realized was we couldn't work in isolation. And so we created this really large, wonderful group. At the time, there, you know, the uh, mass communicate, we didn't have Twitter or anything like that back then. But we had email and we had cell phones and we, and we worked them tirelessly. We, we literally created this very beautiful interfaith, interage group. We had cantors and rabbis and priests and poets and painters and people who were, you know, 14 and people that were 74. We had survivors and, and, um, and students. So there was just this very beautiful, uh, diverse group that was dedicated to a very powerful mission. And I think with luck and perhaps with some choreography from other places, um, our energies were right. And we lobbied and advocated for two years in a row. We, we took a little yellow school bus up to Frankfurt. I was lucky that our principal 
resonated with the mission and allowed us to go as frequently as we did. But we went from office to office handing out literature. We stood on the steps of the Capitol with gigantic banners um, and, and just made ourselves present for two years in a row. The people who were initially against it began to get an awful lot of pressure to pass it. We were called in to this. There was one senator whose finger was on the button of stop or go on most legislation. And we were called in after two years to this uh, senator's office to work with one of his administrative assistants. And essentially the message was, we'll pass it if you just stop bothering us. And so, however, they made some changes to it. The changes were really hard for us to, to um, navigate through. They were really very painful actually because there was a lot of the legislation that was taken out. One of the most powerful parts of the legislation that was taken out, we thought was, you know, we mentioned that the Holocaust is a wonderful place in which to gather our students because they can bear witness to what happens when prejudice, hate, and intolerance is aimed at individuals that are marginalized. And we specifically stated that the Nazis um, placed in the crosshairs of their hate and othering specific groups. We mentioned the Roma, Sinti, but we also mentioned homosexuals. And that wasn't a group that Kentucky, the Kentucky Senate, Senator wanted to be mentioned at all at the time. There was phenomenal uh, homophobia at the time, and um, they wanted that group to be removed. And we didn't want to remove that group. So the only way it would pass is if they were gone. So I actually let the survivors who were working on the legislation with us take the lead in the discussion and the prayer for that. And we realized that this would never become legislation on, unless we did. And so we did, unfortunately, but it passed, that legislation passed. But when it passed, we knew that it was gonna pass in a version which probably would need um, to be healed. It, legislation often comes out broken and we knew that it would just because there had been so much opposition to it. And so the legislation that passed wasn't what we had originally intended. The initial legislation was no longer a mandate. It was only permission. Teachers who, no, who initially had to get specific permission from their districts no longer had to get permission. They could teach it if they wanted to, but there was no mandate whatsoever on it. Um, as well, they left out wording and groups that we, f we felt um, needed to be fixed. We immediately went back in 2006 trying to pass some amendments that would create a mandate uh, for it to be in classrooms as well as a mandate for assessment. And what we found again was great opposition. We had no idea when we started in 2006 that it would, it would be over 10 years before legislation that truly mandated Holocaust education in Kentucky would pass. And people often questioned, you know, why are you still doing this? This has been such a long time. Can't you be satisfied with what's already been passed? And the answer was always no, because we knew the Commonwealth could do better. We believe that Holocaust education in and of itself was a, a, a distinct and powerful component for specifically fighting anti-Semitism. And we believed that it, at the time that it would work without really ever mentioning the word anti-Semitism. And obviously we couldn't have been more wrong. I think the times in which we live in today, you know, speak profoundly to how wrong we were. We anecdotally, you know, gathered evidence and realized that, you know, Holocaust education as it was occurring was really wonderful at creating historians who knew about the Holocaust and the years and the causes and they knew places and dates and names. And, but in terms of generating or creating those interior journeys where students can give really deep consideration to who it is that they are becoming and how it is that they would pronounce themselves into the world if they were to be creators of, of, of pro-social or, or, or positive energy, compassionate activities, we weren't sure if that was necessarily occurring, that it wasn't being transferred into the times in which they live. So that 10 years actually allowed us to become more wise and um, to become just more ferociously intentional about our legislation. The purpose of the legislation changed. We added the rationale statement, which was written by uh, an interfaith group, Rabbi's Cantors. Um, there was direct input from a survivor 
It was inspired by the life stories of the survivors after whom the legislation is named. It passed. It was a snowy, cold winter day when we found out the vote was being taken. There was no school that day, so the kids couldn't go because the roads were choked with snow. But I, I rode up with Fred Gross after uh, the gentleman after whom the legislation was named. Um, the other two survivors had unfortunately passed, but we rode together up to Frankfurt and watched as the vote was taken, watched as people gave their speeches detailing why it is that they wanted to vote for it. They were inspiring, just powerful resonance with what we were doing. But at the end of the day, it passed unanimously. It was, it was amazing. Um, I still look back on that as, as um, you know, as educators, we hope that every day is meaningful, but it's, it's one of the most meaningful things that I have done with my, my teacher life. The legislation is so new. Um, it was only last year that the mandate kicked in. So we've only had two years of teachers teaching. Um, I, I've had an awful lot of emails from educators who are wanting to understand how do I do it effectively? Um, how is it that I can create these relationships? And those are, it's uplifting and inspiring to know that there's people that are beginning to care about that. I hope that educators share the concerns that are expressed in the rationale statement. I hope that educators understand that it's not two things, teaching the Holocaust and teaching students about anti-Semitism so that they can be called to create in their own lives ways to counter it. If those aren't two things, they must occur uh, simultaneously, it, it's one thing. Um, and if we do that successfully, I would say that the legislation has been a great success. We also love for there to be an understanding and an awareness of what's in the rationale. We don't just want to teach the Holocaust, we want to teach the Holocaust so that the better, the world is a, a better place for all of us, but especially for our Jewish brothers and sisters. You know, we want to teach the Holocaust in a fashion that that catalyzes that desire for classrooms to create relationships with people of all faiths, especially marginalized groups, but especially with their Jewish brothers and sisters. I don't know what it would take to change that, but if those changes occur, then again, I would be incredibly pleased. And I know the survivors that helped to write the legislation would be as well. If I was only given a few minutes and could speak to teachers, you know, I would really hope that people understand that the legislation has a history, and that history goes all the way back to 1933, Germany, um, because survivors are at the heart of this. Echoing in the names, uh, Ernie Marx and Fred Gross and Anne Klein, the, 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 uh, those are survivors. Their names are attached to the names of this legislation. You know, and all of them had a hope when they went from school to school. All of them taught across Kentuckyana, teaching about the Holocaust. But they were never teaching about the Holocaust only so that people would know in history. They were teaching about the Holocaust so that what happened to them would never happen to their family members. They were teaching about the Holocaust so that people would understand that their pain could have meaning. And um, I just hope that people understand that if they're teaching about the Holocaust because they're being mandated to, that they're being mandated by individuals who were deeply affected by the Holocaust. It's their voices, their intentions, their dream of creating a world where there wasn't anti-Semitism that is really imbued in every word of this legislation. Now, umbilical to it, to this bill, was the dreams of three people who stood face to face with um, people who created the Holocaust. And I hope people know that. That would be great to know.